Let's pray, shall we, together. Father, we come to you tonight and we say that we want to lift up Jesus and we want him glorified by everything that is said and everything that is thought tonight. We do worship you, Father, that your word is so full and so varied that it covers every situation and every problem that we can have in our lives. And Father, that you put the answer to every situation, every heartache, Father, every difficulty is right there, found in Jesus and in the revelation of your word. Father, t tonight we come and celebrate your fatherhood, that you look after us, that you teach us these wonderful things. And we pray, Father, that we might become faithful to your word. And Father, that we should not be hearers of the word only, but doers also. Father, tonight in Jesus' name, will you just bless, Father, all who are in this room, that, Father, they might receive the words in their spirits, that they may have a revelation of them, and that, Father, indeed, the devil should gain less and less and less glory in this world as the church becomes more and more glorious. Father, we want to see the church built up. We want to see the church edified. And we know that the milk and the meat are the word of God. So tonight, Father, we come with ravenous appetites. Hallelujah. And Father, we thank you that you are going to provide our every need. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We saw last week how tremendous is the weapon of prophecy. We saw that if a believer knows how to use prophecy correctly then actually he finds that he has at his disposal something that's so sharp and so keen that most enemies of the gospel and most enemies of God and most enemies of the word of God uh, tend to run away and flee before the gift of prophecy that we have been given in the word of God. The Bible critic, as we saw last week, finds prophecy extremely hard to stomach. For to him it speaks of a God who not only knows everything, but is prepared to reveal everything to his children. And we find that most uh, Bible critics head immediately for the prophetic passages. For a God who knows everything and declares that he knows everything cannot exist to them, and so be, must be explained away. And you remember we saw last time how they have to try and deal with the prophetic passages, and the way that they deal with them is instead of treating them as prophetic passages, they try and explain them away as historical passages. We saw last week, I think, how the book of Daniel, instead of being written in 600 BC, they try and move it up 400 years so it's written actually in 200 BC. And then they can say that all the stuff that Daniel contains was written after the event, and that's why it's so accurate. For us, we know that actually all they're trying to do is to run away from the major weapon that we have in our arsenal. But tonight we move on, and leaving what prophecy does to the unbeliever, and leaving the unbeliever grappling with the problem, we now go on to see tonight what prophecy does in the life of the believer. For it is certainly true that if the Bible consists of a great proportion of prophecy, as it does, God thinks it's necessary for me today, standing in Chichester tonight, to have that amount of prophecy. And the question is, what is it that prophecy gives me that God thinks is so necessary for my Christian life? And so we come on to the subject tonight of faith and hope. And we're going to actually work with those two words tonight. We're really going to see what faith is, and we're really going to see what hope is, and we're going to learn something about what these two things do in our lives. Praise God. Actually, faith and hope, as you readily appreciate, are actually two words of a trinity of words that always seem to come together. These three words are always joined together, and in the Bible, time and time and time again, they're used together. To show you which three words they are, in case you don't know your Bible that well, would you turn with me, and we'll begin tonight in 1 Corinthians and chapter 13 and verse 13. So the first scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And here we see this trinity. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abideth faith, hope, 
and charity or love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Hallelujah. Now there's the, the great trinity. You've got faith, you've got hope, and you've got love. And you may have noticed something that's rather interesting in the church today. There are plenty of tapes on faith. And there are plenty of books written about faith. And there are plenty of tapes and plenty of books written on the subject of love. But there aren't so many, you know, written about the subject of hope. And what we're going to see tonight is that actually hope and prophecy are so co-linked, are so joined together, that when the devil switched off prophecy, he automatically tried to switch off hope in the life of the believer. I do not know many believers who have a full understanding of what hope is all about. But there you've got it. In the Bible, it's faith and it's hope and it's love. And the three exist and carry on existing. We get hope used time and time and time again. We have phrases such as the hope of our salvation. Christ in us, the hope of glory, the hope of righteousness, the hope of the gospel. All these wonderful phrases. They all mean something and they're all important as far as we are concerned. Let's see a few other passages, shall we, where this trinity uh, of faith and hope and love are used together. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, verse 3 to verse 5. Colossians 1, verse 3 to verse 5. And here Paul is writing, and look what he says. And in my Bible, I've got the three words underlined, just to remind me that here's the Trinity coming up again. We give thanks to God, he says, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, there's the first, and of the love which ye have towards saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. There's three. Let's see another passage. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians and chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. Had this been written today, hope would have been conveniently missed out as something that doesn't apply to Christians in the move of the Spirit. Fortunately, the early church was more in the move of the Spirit than we are. And here is Paul emphasizing hope and giving it equal status to faith and to love. Verse 3. Remembering, he says, oh, I'll begin verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Now there's the three. In case this hasn't quite convinced you, if the reference to hope in Ephesians speaks volumes. And if you turn with me to Ephesians and chapter 1, verse 15, we find that he's commenting on how wonderful their faith is and commenting how wonderful their love is. And what does he say? Well, now, he says, I'm praying that you're going to receive hope. Let's read it. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. Ephesians 1 and verse 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, he's praying for something. What's he praying for? It begins in verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye might know what is the hope of his calling. Now there he's praying, look, you've got the faith, you've got the love, but you, you really must have the hope as well. And we Christians really need hope equally to faith and love. In, I found, actually, praise the Lord, as I was looking today, I found the most wonderful verse uh, about hope, which is found in Romans and chapter 15, verse 13, which shows the emphasis. Romans, chapter 15, and verse 13. Verse 13. 
Now the God of hope, he says, the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. All right, with all this emphasis on hope, what is hope? That's what we've got to see. And how does it fit in with faith? Now let me tell you, faith is what gives you peace now. You may be dwelling in peace and great joy at this moment, very happy in God, knowing that God has provided for you in the past and knowing that today he has provided. Now that's faith. Faith is your security and your peace now. Hope is your security and peace for the future. Praise God. And I have met so many Christians who can say, yes, I feel tremendously blessed today, but as soon as you mention next week, a cloud forms over them. They don't know that the God who looked after them today will also look after them tomorrow. And they're not sure about next week. And they're not sure about next month. And then it does look as if persecution's going to hit this country. And they're a bit worried about that. And say you get locked up in prison. And how awful it is. I tell you, if you are in that category, you may have faith, but you don't know anything about hope, at least not yet. And if you actually have a look at prophecy, prophecy shows us both faith and hope, because prophecy develops both faith and hope. Let's have a look and see how faith actually develops. The Word of God says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes when you know God. Faith comes when you understand all the character of God and what God thinks about you. And how do you know that? You know that by looking at the way God has worked in the past. As you consider the way God's worked in the past, so it builds up your faith until today you can say, yes, I know where I am as far as God is concerned. Now, this concept that faith is related to the past is really quite strange to most Christians. But the Jews understood it exactly. And the Old Testament shows us the real nature of faith and what faith is all about. You see, the Jews had a a, a system which God had given them which constantly reminded them them of the past. It's an odd thing, isn't it? Because we live in now. And they lived in now. But they were constantly reminded about the past. Their calendar reminded them about the past. Have you ever thought about the Jewish calendar and the way that it did that? Constant reminder about the past. Once a year, they had to hold, on a certain day in the first month, a feast called the Feast of the Passover. Every year, on the exact same day, they held the exact same feast. And connected with the feast was a whole ritual. And every year without fail, they had to go through the same ritual. And all the children were there. And in every home in Israel, the same ritual was was gone through. And they taught the children what the ritual meant. Now what were they doing? They were remembering a past event every year. And they taught it to their children. Now their ritual had meaning. Once a year, we remember Christmas Day. Look at the ritual that we have in Christmas Day. We have a turkey. We open presents. Uh, We normally listen to the Queen's speech. At least I always listen to the Queen's speech. The next day, we have Boxing Day. But you see, it's all meaningless ritual. You might explain to your children, well, on Boxing Day, the servants used to open their present. But so what? It doesn't teach them anything about anyone, particularly. But that wasn't true in the Jewish times. In the, to the Jews, and it still happens today, they were taught a ritual which had meaning to remind them about something. Let's see when it began. Let's take, actually, the Feast of Passover and see how it developed. Turn with me to Exodus 13. Exodus 13. And here it's talking about the Feast of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, the Feast of the Passover was what they celebrated when they came out of Egypt. Who got them out of Egypt? God did. Did they do anything to get themselves out of Egypt? They did nothing to get themselves out of Egypt. God got them out. 
So once a year, they remembered, isn't it wonderful? We've got a God who's so powerful, he can get us out of Egypt by himself. Hallelujah. Once a year. And all the children, from the time that they're knee high, is it knee high to a grasshopper? When they're this small, they start learning once a year about this marvelous God who really did lead them out across the Red Sea. Look what it says, verse 8. And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, and here's the father, a message to the fathers. You t- take your sons and you start telling them something saying, this is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in this season from year to year. Praise God. Now do you see, that is building faith on something in the past. Not only did they do that once a year, they also did something once a week which reminded them of the Exodus. And that was they kept the Sabbath. Now I'm not going to deal with the Sabbath tonight, but there are some people who think that the Sabbath actually has something to do with the fact that God rested on the seventh day and it was kept in Israel because God rested on the seventh day. That is not correct. In the Bible, it certainly says in Genesis that God hallowed the seventh day. But the interesting thing is, there is not one mention in the Bible anywhere of anyone keeping the Sabbath before the Jewish law came about. There's not one mention anywhere. And in fact, one of the major books, which uh, um, actually deals with the life of a man who lived before the Exodus and before the law was given, that's the book of Job, doesn't mention the Sabbath anywhere. It mentions the flood. It mentions all sorts of principles concerning God. It doesn't mention the Sabbath. And other passages of Scripture, which I will deal with when I deal with the subject of the Sabbath, actually show us that the Sabbath was to do with the Exodus. And it was from the time of the Exodus that they started keeping the Sabbath day holy. Now, this may come as a shock to some of you. Let me give you a Scripture which shows just that point. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy and chapter 5. Deuteronomy and chapter 5. And we'll begin verse 12. Deuteronomy 5, verse 12. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And here it is, verse 15. And remember, and this is what you must do on the Sabbath day, And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt. That's the Exodus. Remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Every day they did no work at all because what they were saying is on that day God must provide for me. And they reminded themselves every single day that God was the type of God who was so wonderful, so loving, so powerful that he could provide even when they couldn't provide for themselves. And their children learnt that on every Sabbath day. That's what the Sabbath was about. It's the exodus. And it was constantly teaching them, this is the type of God we've got. Those children were brought up in faith. Those children knew the type of God that they had. And by the way, it wasn't only in their calendar. All around the land of Israel, there were piles of stones left everywhere. Huge piles of stones. You would just be walking along, suddenly there's a pile of stone on the side of the road. Or there'd be a tomb. Or there'd be a tree. There were so many things, or a brook. 
And as soon as the Israelites saw them, they all used to sit down, and it was Bible study time. Praise God. And that's what they did. They went for a family picnic, and they went to a pile of stones, and they all sat down, and they all opened their luncheon baskets, and then the father would begin and say, Now, children, would you just listen? Do you see this pile of stones? I'll tell you why this pile of stones is here. Because... God did a mighty miracle at this spot. These stones were actually put here by, and he'd name the character. And they'd gaze at the stones and say, really? These stones were put there by that character? This wonderful. And then he'd recite over and over and over again the story of the miracle. So that those children knew all about their history, constantly knowing about the glories that God had done. Hallelujah. And I bet sometimes the father used to say, where would you like to go today? And they used to choose their favorite Bible story. And out they used to go to a pile of old stones. Or sit by a tomb somewhere. And God used to expound the glories, the wonders that had gone on in that particular place. Let's actually see an example of that in Joshua and chapter 4. This is why God put them there. Because God commanded that this should happen. Joshua and chapter 4. And we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 7. And it came to pass, when all the children were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, this is Joshua 4, 1 to 7, verse 2, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man. And command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Now here's the river. It's in full flood. God had opened the river up. And God says, Now hold on, before you, uh -uh, before it, it all comes to pass, I want you to pick up twelve stones. Twelve stones. Who's building the pile of stones? God's building the pile of stones for a purpose. Why? Because God knows that faith is related to a historical memory. As you remember the glories that God's done, as you remember the things he's done in your life, so your faith is increased. And faith has to do with knowing the character of God and what God has done. Now, he tells them what to do. Verse 4. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And if you go down to the end of verse 9, you'll find just at the end, and they are there unto this day. Hallelujah. And it says here, gather your children, you tell them what happened. That the waters parted in front of the ark of God. Now there is faith produced by past memory. Things that have happened in the past. And I want to say this to us as a fellowship. I will not be happy until I hear our children in the fellowship chanting and reciting the gospel stories until they know them off by heart. And I will not be satisfied until both, both in the family and in the Sunday schools, the stories, the great wonders of the Old Testament are learnt by those children until every father is saying, I've got a story to tell you. One day there was a people in bondage and God so loved them, he brought them out of bondage. If you want faithful children, I'll tell you the way to get them faithful. You start teaching them some of the marvelous things that Jesus has done. Hallelujah. And you will find that they will be faithful children. They will grow up with a God who's real and a God who's a miracle worker. Hallelujah. Right, now that is what faith is. Well, hope is faith for the future. Faith for the future. 
And the word hope, when it's used biblically, is not the same as the word hope as we use it in our everyday lives. In our everyday lives, we sort of say, oh, I hope it won't rain tomorrow. Or I hope so-and-so doesn't come this afternoon because I'm rather busy. Or I hope my car doesn't get another flat tyre. Or something like this. In other words, well, I'm not sure. It might rain tomorrow. It might not rain tomorrow. That's not biblically sound. Not at all. Hope in the Bible is assurance about what is going to happen. You are positively sure. The hope of salvation is that you know you're going to be saved. Hallelujah. That's what it is. The hope of glorification is you know you're going to be glorious. The hope of the gospel is that the world may be saved. Hallelujah. Hope is assurance in the future. That's what it's all about. And you'll notice how it's related. We saw this last week. Jesus was raised past faith. And I shall be raised. Future hope. Hallelujah. When you say hope, you're not saying, well, perhaps I might be and perhaps I won't be. That's not what biblical hope means. It means I definitely will be. Hallelujah. And I definitely will be secure in the future. And I definitely will be blessed. The hope of blessing is when I stand up and say, oh, I'm living in the hope of blessing. I'm not saying, well, I hope you'll bless me, God. I just hope you will. But you might not. You're not saying that. You're saying, I know from your character, you've blessed me in the past, and you're going to bless me in the future. Hallelujah. You'll find this time and time again, especially in the book of Romans. Let's have a look at the book of Romans, and let's see it. Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. <clears throat> Romans 6. And verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, past faith by the glory of the Father, and we believe it, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, so shall we also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That's why we live in the knowledge and the repetition of the resurrection of Christ. Hallelujah. Because we know that we shall be like him. We see this again if you just go over the page in Romans in chapter 5. You'll see the exact principle here. Romans in chapter 5 and beginning verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in his glory in our lives. Then it goes on, and here's the interesting thing. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also. It is saying that we rejoice when we've really been through hard circumstances. Now why? I'll tell you why, because it gives us a historical memory. Oh yes, it's true that God delivered the Jews from Egypt. But do you know, it's also true, he delivered me from some Egypts. Hallelujah. And therefore, I rejoice in those tribulations. Why? Because I know something about my God from them. And I rejoice in the tribulations, it says. Why? Because, and it goes on, verse 3, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Here's a problem and it doesn't get sorted out. And so what do you do? You start waiting on God. And that's the first thing. Instead of having it solved immediately, you start now submitting yourselves to God. You start waiting on God. And you will find that gradually then, the whole situation starts coming right. So, tribulation worketh, here it is, patience, verse 4, and patience worketh experience. Now, you've been through a difficult situation. It wasn't solved immediately. It took time to solve it. But it was solved in the end. And you suddenly say, hey, I've learnt something about God through this experience. I've learnt that he is able. I've learnt that he's the one who can do anything. And as soon as you've learnt that, then you find the next thing. After experience, hope. 
and experience work at hope. Because you know that if you go through that again, he'll deliver you again. Hallelujah. That's what hope's about. Oh, hallelujah. May I say it for you? Praise the Lord. It's wonderful. That's what it's all about. And so, through our experiences, we can say, yes, God builds up our faith and builds up our hope because we know he'll deliver us in the future. And that's marvelous because I can then come to you and I can say to anyone in this room, I've been through that situation and God delivered me. Didn't my God deliver Daniel? Amen. Historical memory, faith. Didn't he deliver me? Right, historical memory, faith. And won't he deliver you? Hope. Hallelujah. He sure will. Praise the Lord. Now that's the relationship. And you'll find that prophecy is so developed that it develops both faith and hope. And that's why we get two types of prophecy. And you know what the two types are. We have, first of all, fulfilled prophecy. And the second type is unfulfilled prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy develops your faith. Unfulfilled prophecy develops your hope. Hallelujah. And there you've got what prophecy is all about. No wonder the devil has switched off hope. He'd like us nice and defeated, wouldn't he? Hallelujah. But we're beginning to thwart him. Praise God. Now you've got to understand this principle. Because God in the Old Testament prophecies has developed uh, a system whereby he gives some prophecy, half of which will be fulfilled in the lifetime of the people who hear it, and half of which will not be fulfilled in the lifetime of those who hear it. I better say that again. Old Testament prophecy always consists of the same pattern. You've got half that is actually fulfilled in the lifetime of the believers who hear the prophecy. And half is unfulfilled in the lifetime of the people who hear the prophecy. Now why? Because as they're going through something, they see that the thing that's been prophesied is coming to pass. That builds up their faith. And then they see what God promises them. And it builds up their hope. You will always find this in the Bible, that the major prophetic books have not been given during the golden eras of the Jews. There was a golden era, you know, between the Exodus, or or just after the Judges, really, and through King King David's reign and King Solomon's reign. How much prophecy? Hardly any. How much prophecy was given in the the beautiful times, the, the golden era that followed the prophet Malachi? Hardly any. In fact, none that's recorded as far as we are concerned. Where was all the prophecy given? It was given in real troublesome and hard times. Because that's what prophecy is best for. Prophecy comes into its own when you've really got to go through something. So you get Isaiah, and you get Ezekiel, and you get Jeremiah, and you get Daniel. And they all talk about the terrible time that's coming. But you'll always find half the prophecy is about how the Babylonians are going to come. They're going to destroy the land. And the Assyrians are going to come. And they're going to knock down all your cities. And then it goes on to talk about the glorious restoration. When every man will dwell in peace. When every man will own his own vineyard. When every man is going to have his own plot of land. And the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. Now what happens? There they are and they receive this prophecy. Then the Babylonians hit. And then the famine starts. And then the bloodbath starts. And as soon as they see that, they say, hey, what what did Jeremiah say? And they turn to the book of Jeremiah. Oh, it's coming to pass. This is what he meant. And there they are. They're really going through it. They're really oppressed. And then they read on and they find it's going to be all right in the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Ah, the Assyrians around us. Why? That's what Isaiah said would happen. Oh, that's wonderful, because he also went on to say that we win. Hallelujah. And so you find their faith and their hope are both increased. Now, Jesus did just the same. Turn quickly with me, please, to Matthew chapter 24, and let's see a few verses in Matthew 24. 
Well, I'm so thrilled I get excited by these things. Hallelujah. I really am so excited about, about that. Praise God. Because I want you to know this is what gives me the stability I have in my Christian life. I get really excited by this. Hallelujah. Because this is jolly exciting stuff. Silence. Hallelujah. <laughs> Chapter 24. Matthew 24. And I'm just going to take a few verses and let's see how Jesus actually handles prophecy. Let's see how he handles prophecy. They ask him, Jesus, what's, going to, what's it going to be like when you return at the end of the world? What's it going to be like? Now, if they'd asked me, I'd have said, well, it's going to be like this. There's going to be darkness over the whole face of the earth. And then all of a sudden, there's going to be a bright sign, the sign of the Son of Man coming in the heavens. And I'm telling you now, and that's what, how it's going to be. But you see, that doesn't give them any reality when they then had to go through the persecutions and the tribulation. So what does Jesus do? He tells them all about the tribulation leading up to that point. Hallelujah. And he tells it them before it starts so that they know that his word will be fulfilled definitely. Hallelujah. Matthew 24, let's just see a few of these. And this is how he talks to them. Verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And shall deceive many. And there's the early church. And suddenly, oh, here's a man. I'm Christ. And he's got a big following. Don't get uptight. It's what Jesus said would happen. Hey, I've met a man. The first I've met. And he said he was Christ. And he's got a big following. What did Jesus say about this? Look, it's come to pass. Hallelujah. Hey, perhaps Jesus does know what he's talking about. Praise God. Next verse. Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places, including the ones in which you live. Hallelujah. I'm warning you, he says, before they come to pass. Um, Verse 9. Then shall they uh, uh, deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And so it goes on. If you go across to verse 25, this is the point. Behold, I have told you before. And here were the persecuted church, and in the future there will be Jews who are going through terrible persecution. They're going to read these passages. And and in the future they're going to say, hey, 2,000 years ago Jesus started talking about this, and it's come to pass. Well, I think we'd better read on, because he doesn't leave them just there. He takes them into the realm of hope. And if you read on just a little bit, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth, and so on. Verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. We're going to be all right, folks. Hallelujah. Because he's going to gather us. He's going to gather us together. I think we'll be all right. Hey, but they've just killed your uncle. It doesn't matter. Jesus said they'd kill him. Jesus said we should be killed. Jesus said we were going to be afflicted. But we win in the end. Hallelujah. So pucker up, everybody. Praise God. Keep your pucker up. That's what this is all about. And that's what prophecy is all about. This is why 1 Thessalonians was prophetic. For the Thessalonian church was really going through it. Their loved ones were being killed, left, right and centre. Their husbands, their children were being slaughtered. What would you have done if you'd heard about that and you had to write a letter to them? Paul knew that what they needed in a time of affliction and a time of difficulty was prophecy. Because prophecy builds up faith and gives you hope. Let's see. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians And chapter 4. And beginning verse 13. They've lost their loved ones. Paul doesn't waste any stupid sympathy. Their loved ones are with the Lord. He'd he'd already uh, taught them about what it meant to go to be with the Lord. They were with the Lord. And Philippians, he was going to write Philippians a little later. And in that he says, which is much better. 
much better than being down here, so what are you so anxious about? Look what he says. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others, which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus and rose from the, get, the dead, do we believe that? We do. Faith. Even so, and here's the hope, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. This is uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 on. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not go before those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Hey, he says, your beloved husband is going to get up there before you are. Hallelujah. That's prophecy. Praise God. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Start talking prophecy with one another. I can tell you with my knowledge of prophecy, I get excited every time I hear of a world crisis. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. And so, so all our enemies are up against us. Well, hallelujah, Jesus is coming soon. And that's the meaning of this passage. Now, to bring all these thoughts together, I'm going to give you an example. And this is a marvelous example from the Old Testament, and it concerns our great man of faith, Abraham. So would you turn with me, please, to Abraham... Uh, sorry, to Genesis <laughs> chapter 15... <clears throat> Yes, I'm just about to write a new book. I haven't told you yet. <laughs> Genesis and chapter 15. And we see Abraham. Now this is the most glorious and wonderful story. And it shows us that this nature of fulfilled and unfulfilled prophecy was here even in the time of Abraham. Here it is. Now, you remember the situation, of course. Abraham had obeyed the word of the Lord, and for ten years he'd been in the place that God wanted, to, wanted him to be in. But Abraham wanted his own male heir. Oh, he just wanted a son. That's all he wanted. And he wanted to know, God, I've been here ten years, and I haven't had a boy yet. You know, please, what are you going to do about this situation? Now, what does God do? Well, he's going to give him hope through prophecy. But that's not the main point that I'm going to make from this passage. But let's just see the little bit of prophecy. Um, verse 3, Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, no one born in my house is mine heir. Verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but... He that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Now there's a promise. It's a prophecy. Abraham, or Abraham as he was, you're going to have your own son. Now there's hope. But then God, because he's a generous hearted God, <laughs> he gives the rest of the details as well. Now this is a wonderful thing. He doesn't just say you're going to have one son. He then goes on in verse 5. And he brought him forth. Hey, Abraham, you know that sum we were talking about? You come outside with me, just a sec. And it was a nice, clear night. The type of night, you know, when the owls go hunting and they can see easily. And the rabbits are lit up on the hillside. And the stars are showing and the Milky Way can be seen. And, that, and God says, hey, Abraham, just look up a sec. How many stars do you think are up there? How many stuff? Well, I wouldn't like to. I wouldn't like to guess. So many more than I can count. I don't know what the number is. Ah, oh, well, Abraham, I've got news for you. And look at this news that he says. Look now towards heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And there's Baron Abraham and Baron Sarah. They don't have one son. And God says they're going to have more than all these. Hallelujah. Now that's prophecy. And God knew. He counted them all. 
God, in his foreknowledge, had counted all the people who were going to be descendants of Abraham, and he counted the number of stars in the Milky Way, and guess what? There were more descended from Abraham. Hallelujah. And so he says, Abraham, you can see fewer stars than you're going to have children. Praise God. Now, isn't that wonderful prophecy? And the great thing about Abraham was, he believed it. He didn't go away and say, oh, Sarah, honestly, I knew we were in the right, this move of the Spirit is just crazy. <laughs> you know, it just is ridiculous. They're telling me ridiculous things now. He went and he started rejoicing in his heart with Abraham. He almost danced with glee because he believed the word of the Lord. And the word believed is, uh, he amend it. Well, the, amen, if you say that, that's what I'm going to say. And I think he must have swank like a new father. Like a new father. He must have swanked, you know, well, my boy, well, there's only one, but you've no idea what's coming. That's the type of faith that he had. Now, that was prophetic. But Abraham had got it slightly wrong. Because, you see, Abraham thought it was going to be simple. Abraham thought it was going to be, oh, quite easy. He'd have a son. He'd have sons. And that God would then give them the land. Because if you notice, um, verse 7 the Lord also went on to say, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And Abraham thought, well, fine, my son will have children, they'll have children, and they'll just live in this land. But God knew it wasn't going to be as easy as that. Because God knew that soon the descendants of Abraham would be most unfaithful to God. And that as discipline, he'd have to take them into Egypt where they become slaves Oh, they get the land eventually, but not immediately. And so God's faced with this problem. How is he going to keep the generation who live in Egypt in faith and in hope? You see, Abraham was all right, because he was going to die before it all happened. But how was God going to keep that, that um, generation who were under discipline in faith when they found it so hard in the land? Now, when you're in oppression and when you're in trouble, what do you need? You need prophecy. So what does God do? He gives Abraham a bit more prophecy. You might have said, well, this is a bit rotten. This will get the chap depressed. Not at all. This prophecy was going to keep the people in faith for nearly 400 years. Let's read it. Verse 13. Up to verse 13, by the way, God's entered into covenant with Abraham. Verse 13, and here's more prophecy, and God fills in the details. He said unto Abraham... Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, that's Egypt, and shall serve them, that is, become slaves, and they shall afflict them, they're really going to treat them terribly, for 400 years. But it doesn't stop there. That's bad enough. But then comes the good news. And here we get it. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards your seed shall come out rich, that's what great substance means. Now, that's good news. 400 years of oppression, but you'll come out rich. And what will you do then? Well, verse 15 is Abraham. By the way, you're going to die and you'll be in peace, so don't you worry about this. Verse 16, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now, that's a prophecy. I want you to imagine, say, a, a little time after this prophecy is given, and you have Jews in the land of Egypt. At first it was fine. It was wonderful. But now they found that they're in terrible bondage. And the Egyptians' whips are very harsh. And their backs have become scarred. And they found that their skin has become toughened by the heat of the sun. And it looks as if all hope, all hope is gone. And then someone remembers that God said something to Abraham, didn't he, about this? Here we are, we're slaves, we're serving this foreign land, these Egyptians. Didn't, didn't, didn't someone say something to Abraham? I'm sure God said something. And they called the wise men and they said, excuse me, but uh, did, what, what did God say about this? And he said, oh, well, God said to Abraham, before it came to pass, that we come into Egypt and that we'd actually become their slaves. Oh, I see. Well, that's come to pass. Fulfilled prophecy. Ah, oh, but he said a bit more. He said that eventually God will come and judge is Egypt and that you'd leave the country rich. Hallelujah. 
Suddenly their heart starts beating. You know what the, the Jews like, hallelujah. And their hearts start beating. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Hallelujah. And suddenly they get hope for the future. Wonderful hope begins flowing through their veins. They know all about it now. And he'll take you back to the land. Oh, thank you, Lord. We're not going to be here forever. And God, by the way, so gracious, he not only left them with a prophecy, he left them with some, something else. To see this, turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 50 and verse 22. Genesis 50, 22, where we see Joseph. You remember, don't you, the reference in Genesis 15 to the fourth generation. Could I just, while you're turning to Genesis 50, write out the four generations? The first generation was Levi, generation one. The second generation was Levi's son, Kohath, generation two. Kohath had a son called Amram, generation three. And Amram had a son called Moses, generation four. You can check those for yourself in 1 Chronicles chapter 6. And God's word was going to come to pass in the fourth generation. Hallelujah. Who led them out of Egypt? Moses did. That was prophesied 400 years before it actually happened. Praise the name of Jesus. All right, now let's see this. And here we get Joseph, and we get a marvelous statement. Verse 22, And Joseph dwelt in, in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived 110 years. Oh, and this is it, verse 23. This is a gorgeous phrase. Why is this in the Bible? It's because of this four-generation promise. Here is Joseph, verse 23. And Joseph saw Ephraim, Ephraim's children of the third generation can you imagine what Joseph felt? He knew that God had said, in the fourth generation, you're going to leave Egypt. And there, sitting on his knee, was a little boy who was the third generation. Joseph must have said, hallelujah, one of his children is going to see us leave Egypt rich. I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And he must have told Ephraim and said, Ephraim, you watch this. This Little lad, he's going to have a son. As soon as you see his son, that's the child that's going to go out of Egypt. That's when we're going to be delivered. Oh, Joseph must have been thrilled with that little one. I think he must have really asked God, Lord, can I just see the next one? But God didn't see fit to grant it. He was so excited by this, you see. There it is. Oh, and, and not only that, the children also of Machia, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. Verse 24, Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely deliver you. The word visit is the word deliver. He'll surely deliver you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely deliver you, and you shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him and put him in a coffin in Egypt. And here is Joseph saying, Oh, God is going to deliver you. And because I believe that, I don't want to be buried in Egypt. Thank you very much. Will you make sure I'm not buried in Egypt? And they said, Yes, we will. And they embalmed his body. They put him in the coffin. And the coffin was left out in the open for the whole time they were in Egypt. And guess what happened? The fathers used to go there for a picnic. Hallelujah. And they used to go up and they used to say, Son, do you see this coffin? This is Joseph. Now Joseph said, we mustn't bury him. Why? Because we're going to go back to the land of our fathers. And in that land, we are then going to bury dear Joseph, faithful, wonderful Joseph, because that's the type of God that we've got. Oh, we're going through it now like God said we would. But the hope is, and Joseph Bones say to us, we're going into the land that is ours. My beloved, I want you to know, prophecy has been given to us for faith and for hope. For he who has done wondrous things shall do wondrous things and shall indeed deliver us to the promised land Hallelujah, where he will be blessed and where he will be glorified. Next week, we go on to Nostradamus 
Mother Shipton and Jean Dixon. God bless you very much.